All right. Well, it's good to be here again and share with you from the Word of God. And we're in the book of Judges, chapter 11, and we're in verse 12. And I'm going to read down to verse 22, but Lord willing, we may get further than that. And so just beginning in verse 12, it says, And, and Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? And the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon, even unto Jabek, Jabok, and unto Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again peaceably. And Jephthah sent messengers again unto the king of the children of Ammon and said unto him, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereunto. And in like manner they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. But Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, but Sion gathered all his people together and pitched in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country, and they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon, even unto Jabok, and from the wilderness, even unto Jordan. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So as we've been looking at the life of Jephthah, uh, this judge, we saw last time in verses 1 through 11 that Jephthah's victory over his disadvantages. And we saw that he was a great overcomer. He, he had a lot of things to overcome, uh, certainly concerning his birth. Uh, he was illegitimate in birth, uh, his family's rejection, uh, his companions. He was with the so-called worthless men, uh, his geographical area. He was cast out and was up in the area, the land of Tob. And so he was, a, he was somebody who, uh, despite all that, despite all these disadvantages, was an overcomer, a victory over his disadvantages. Now in verses 12 through 28, we're going to see Jephthah's vindication of Israel and how he is going to vindicate them because somebody is saying, we want your land. And of course, to this very hour, people are still saying the same thing to Israel, we want your land. And so we, we, we might title this, by the way, this morning, Land for Peace, <laughs> because uh, he's trying to negotiate peace uh, with this hostile group called the Ammonites who are wanting to attack Israel. And basically the Ammonites are going to respond and say, okay, uh, you can have peace as long as you give us your land. And it sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? We're going to see how up to date the word of God always is. And so land for peace. But so 12 through 28, Jephthah's vindication of Israel. And then 29 through 40, if we get that far, I'm not saying we're going to, but we're going to see Jephthah's victory and Jephthah's vow. And they're both very significant. So his victory over disadvantages, his vindication of Israel, his victory and his vow in the final section. So first of all, his vindication of Israel. And it's kind of a lengthy section, as we've already mentioned, verses 12 through 28 deal with this, uh, this vindication of the nation of Israel. But what, it, what we find surprising is that this man who we've seen leading this band of brigands uh, in 
the area of Tob, uh, these worthless fellows, uh, certainly somebody who is used to conflict and warfare. But what we find here is that his, his fr- when they call him to be the leader of the people uh, to come a- a- and, and defend them against Ammon, the first thing he wants to do is negotiate peace. He, he's clearly not the warmongerer that we would think. Uh, in, in fact, uh, he, he, he starts by opening up these negotiations. And we see a lot, we learn a lot about him. Uh, we learn that he's, he's got a good grasp of the word of God. We, we notice that he's, he's very eloquent because all we're going to read is things that were sent by messengers to the king of Ammon, but are really recordings of what, what he said. And so quite clearly, he's, despite his disadvantages, he's an eloquent man who understands the Bible and is uh, clearly directing uh, affairs to try and bring peace rather than conflict. And partly of that, perhaps, is this, that being a man of war, a mighty man of valor, who has already seen warfare, he certainly doesn't want any more of it and uh, would prefer peace. And uh, I think that's true of us. If we've ever been in times where there's conflict in assembly life, the last thing we want is more of it. <laughs> uh, if you've ever been in the midst of that, uh, it, there's nothing. Uh, it's 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 messy. It's it's it, people get damaged, people get hurt, and the last thing you want is to be part of conflict. And so he he doesn't want it. He he wants peace. And of course, Jephthah's name kind of fits his uh, his verbal gifts. He he opens. That's what Jephthah means. Uh, he he opens or or uh, he, he to release or to open. And what we're going to see is he, he's going to open, but he's going to open his mouth. And what's going to come out of his mouth is the word of God. And he's going to open the scriptures as a defense for Israel's position. And so he's going to live up to his name, uh, opening up the treasures of the word of God uh, to defend Israel and to defend their position. And so he gets in touch in verse 12 with the Ammonites in an attempt to negotiate peace. Verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the children of Ammon, saying, What hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? Why, why are you coming to, uh, to attack my land? Now, it's kind of interesting. Jephthah says, it's my land. In verse 13, we're going to see the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah because Israel took away my land. And so this whole dispute is concerning who owns this land. Is it Jephthah's land? Is it the land of the king of Ammon? Who owns the land? And that, of course, is a question that resonates to this very hour, doesn't it? Concerning that land that we call the land of Israel, who owns the land? And that dispute has con- continued for centuries, and uh, I believe will continue, and will continue to have conflict in that land until the Prince of Peace returns, and then there will be absolute peace in that land, and there will be no more conflict over who owns the land, because the rightful owner of the land will take up possession of it. (laughs) And we'll see that a little bit as we continue this morning. So again, we're we're just emphasizing he's not bent on warfare and destruction. He would like to have peace. He's a capable man. Uh, He's trying to sue for peace. That's what he would like to do. And um, he's not looking for a fight. He's not spoiling for a fight. And again, we just want to make this practical and say, Lord, deliver us in our assemblies from individuals who are spoiling for a fight. There are some brethren, they just love contention. Now we have to contend for the faith. But we should never love it. You know, we should never long for contention. Uh, we have to, there's times we have to stand and there's times we have to fight. But this man is not spoiling for a fight. And Lord, deliver our assemblies from men who are constantly spoiling for a fight. Contentious brethren who just love, seems that they love this stuff. They love controversy. They love conflict. And they're, they're, they cause devastation. Lord, deliver us from that. Uh, We don't want that. He's not a hothead looking for a fight. And again, Lord, deliver us from hotheads. 
Give us people who have got a cool head, <laughs> uh, especially when difficulty comes along. And the Lord, Lord deliver us. And, you know, sometimes in my early days, I can honestly say um, I was definitely a hothead. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you, you know, you get convictions about things. And when you see them threatened, it's very easy uh, for the heat to flow. And and uh, w- we need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit at all times, even when we have to defend the faith. And so Lord deliver us uh, from becoming hotheads. Now, what we're going to see is he based all his arguments as he talks to the king of Ammon on the scriptures. And what's wonderful is that it, it gives a window into this man, Jephthah. You know, again, despite his disadvantages, he had obviously meditated long and hard over the truth of the word of God, and he knew it, and he knew it well. And so he's, he, he has no difficulty defending his position because he's standing on the word of God. And I, I think that's the important thing, too, that when, when we're involved in conflict or difficulty, it, it can't be based on my feelings, my emotions. It has to be my defense of the word of God. God's clearly revealed word. And I have to calmly present the word of God and and say to people, you know, your argument is not with me. It's with scripture. This is what God says. And we have to have that stand on the word of God. And so he based all of his arguments on scripture, ensuring, by the way, there could be no compromise on his part because this is God's revealed word. And we dare not compromise on the word of God. And so he's, he's going to take a stand on the word of God. And so, again, if we would be uh, men who would be useful to God, like this man is going to be a deliverer of Israel. But one of the things we're going to see about him is a man who knows the word of God. And later on, he's a man who the spirit of God comes upon. And, well, how we need today in, in, in our circumstances, in our church, people who know the word of God, and people who are empowered by the Spirit of God. Oh, what a beautiful combination that is, and a combination that brings victory. So there are three parts to his argument. I'm going to just kind of give you the the outline first, and then we'll kind of get right into the, the gist of his argument. There's an argument from history in verses 14 through 22, and he's going to relate the historical background of all of this to show clearly that He hasn't stolen land from the king of Ammon. And so he's going to give a historical argument. Of course, that history is all found in the word of God. He's going to quote right out of uh, the book of Numbers, and we'll talk about those passages presently. And then verse 23 and 24, there's an argument from theology. And then verse 25 through 27, there's an argument from experience. And I, I, I want to just kind of say something here. We're going to we'll develop this more fully. But I really think this is really important, that when we argue uh, on I- important issues, this is the way to deal with it. Start with history, move to theology, and then finally experience. Some people, they start their arguing from experience. No, no, you can't do that. You have to have something more solid to base it on. And so we're going to we'll, we'll kind of develop that as we go. But I think his, his methodology, we can learn a lot from uh, when we're involved in disputes, when we're involved in difficulty. So we'll, we'll pick those things up as we go. But verse 13, so it says, the king of the children of Ammon answered to the messengers of Jephthah, because Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt from Ammon, even to Jabbok, unto Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again peaceably. And so what he's basically saying is this, okay, if you want peace, Jephthah, well, here's how you get peace. You give me the occupied territories. And if you surrender the occupied territories, then we can have peace. <laughs> and again, doesn't it sound so familiar? See, the word of God is so relevant, isn't it? Because 3,000 years later, people are still seeking to negotiate away the land God has given to his people, Israel, on the pretext of bringing peace. And almost every peace deal that U.S. presidents and other people have tried to negotiate always involves Israel giving up land in order for peace. 
and it's going to continue. Now, again, I want to just establish something right now, which I think is very important, and that is this. Who actually owns the land? Because once we learn that, we'll realize that the solution is very simple. Who, who owns this land? Is it belonging to the Ammonites? Uh, is it belonging to Jephthah? And the answer is neither one. It doesn't belong to either one of them. It doesn't even belong to Israel. And it certainly doesn't belong today to the Palestinians. Who owns the land? We can answer that question. It kind of solves a lot of issues. So let's begin in Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And we're going to just kind of learn a little bit about this land that Israel currently, um, at least part of it, are in. Uh, they're not in this part that's in dispute right now. This is the other side, Jordan, that we're talking about. But still, they're being asked to give up more land. So Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles 7, and we'll break in at verse 20. It says, Then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land, which I have given them. In this house, which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. So God speaking here to Solomon in response to Solomon's dedication of the temple. And he's telling it, if, if Israel disobey, what's going to happen is I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land. Whose land is it? It actually belongs to the Lord. It's Jehovah's land. This land is his land. Now, we're not, we're not done. There's a lot more uh, in Scripture about this, Isaiah chapter 14. I just want to see consistently in the word of God, the ownership of the land is not really under dispute as to who the owner is because God has made it very clear. Verse Isaiah 14, verse 25, well, it's breaking from verse 24. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely I have thought, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread on him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. And this is in kind of preparation for the 185,000 crack Assyrian troops that were killed in one night, right? And so God is saying, I'm going to remove the Assyrian. Uh, I'll break the Assyrian in my land. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2. A couple of references in Jeremiah and a couple of references in Ezekiel. And then uh, I think we will have established our case from Scripture. And so it says, and I brought you into a plentiful country. This is Jeremiah 2, verse 7. I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered in, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah 16 and verse 18. Jeremiah 16. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have defiled my land. They have filled mine inheritance with carcasses of their detestable and abominable things. So once again, whose land is it? Well, it's, it's my land, the Lord says. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 and verse 5. Ezekiel 36, verse 5, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen and against all Idumea, which have appointed my land into their possession with the joy of all their heart, with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. And there again, God is talking about how these, these nations, these heathen nations, have appointed my land to their possession. And God is furious over this. This is my land. You have no business appointing my land for your possession. It's my land. I can give it to whoever I want. It's my land. Don't you uh, dare do this. And then chapter 38 of Ezekiel, a final one, verse 16. 
where we read this, it says, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Speaking of a coming day when a confederacy of nations like Iran and Turkey and Russia, kind of interesting how they're all in Syria right now, are going to enter into my land, he says. And, uh, and God's going to bring them so that he can be sanctified among the heathen. And what he's going to do is he's going to bring them there and he's going to destroy them because they dared to attack his land. <laughs> and so, again, just it's just important for us to understand this. It is this dispute, and they're all talking about my land. And so it's very good for us to kind of get to the gist of the matter and say, well, whose land is it? And there's no question. The word of God is absolutely clear that that piece of real estate is the land that belongs to God, the God of Israel. And he has given it to them. But again, if they go after idols, he'll take it off them again, right? But it's his land to dispose with as he sees fit. And certainly for Gentile nations in their arrogance to suggest this or that should happen in his land, God will certainly judge them for their arrogance and their pomposity to dare to question what happens in his land. So again, just it's important, important for us to see that. Now look at verse 14. And all the, the, the scripture basically that he's going to uh, be sharing with the king of Ammon is from the book of Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21, this first part. It's just, it's just kind of quoting straight from the book of Numbers. Again, we're saying Jephthah knew his Bible. Uh, he, he was a man who knew his God and he knew his Bible. And so we want to just recognize that. So Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the children of Ammon, verse 14, and says unto them, Thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. Now, again, he, he said they didn't do that. He's going to explain the details of it. But I want you to, again, see from Scripture that the fact that they didn't take the land from Moab and Ammon was in direct obedience to the clearly revealed word of God. And so I want you to go with me for just a second to the book of Deuteronomy and chapter 2 and see the instructions God had given concerning Moab and Ammon and also Edom uh, come into this as well. So we look at all three while we're here. But Deuteronomy 2 verse 4, And command thou the people, saying, You are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and, Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore. Meddle not with them, for I will not give you of their land, no, not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. Now, chapter 2. In verse 9, and the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given are unto the children of Lot for a possession. And then verse 19, of Deuteronomy chapter 2, and when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. And so the Lord clearly instructed his people not to meddle with the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, all distant relatives of Israel. Remember, uh, Edom, the descendants of Esau, and then Moab and Ammon, the descendants of Lot. And so Israel at all, don't, don't get involved with them. And so clearly th there's biblical precedent here. And so Jephthah says uh, in verse 15, said to them, thus says Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab. And there's reason. They were being obedient to God. They, they knew that they weren't to touch that land. And so he, he's biblical precedent for that. And so it says, 
But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Now, this is where he's quoting from Numbers chapter 20, uh, <clears throat> 21. And that section in verses 14 through 21. And so it says, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. And the king of Edom would not hearken thereunto. And in like manner, they sent unto the king of Moab and he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. And they went along through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sion, king of the Amorites. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. The king of the Amorites, not the Ammonites. Yes, they both, both begin with A, and they both, both end with ites, but the Ammonites and the Amorites are two different peoples. Ammonites, descendants of Lot. Amorites were, uh, again, uh, kind of a, a part of the, the land that was to be judged, basically, uh, a pagan uh, nation that were to come under the judgment of God. Now, again, this is, he's moved from, the first part of Numbers, uh, now he's in Numbers 21, verse 21 through 34. So again, just want you to see this. This, this man, Jephthah, he, he's, he's got his history down. He knows the biblical account. And so now this king of the Amorites, uh, Sion, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. And Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, but Sion gathered all his people together and pitched to, in Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the land of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon to Jabok and from the wilderness even to Jordan. Now, we've been quoting a lot from Numbers. We haven't taken the time to go there. And if you want a homework assignment, you could read Numbers 21. It will give you that detail. But I want to go there now and look at Deuteronomy 32, uh, just to kind of show that this man knows his Bible. Uh, sorry, Numbers 32. Numbers 32. And verses 33. Now, we all know Numbers 32, 23. Uh, we know, if we know any verse in Numbers, we know that one. Be sure your sin will find you out, right? That's the, uh, the, the word given to the two and a half tribes who were given this land of the Amorites to dwell in, this other side Jordan land, what we call the now Gilead and all the area. It was given to the two and a half tribes. And of course, God saying, be sure your sin will find you out was because they, they had sworn that they would go over the Jordan and help Israel in the conquest of Canaan. And if they didn't do that, their sin would find them out, you see. That was for failing to fulfill their vow, their promise, which is kind of significant in the light of this chapter. But verse 33, it says, Moses gave unto them, even to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben and the, unto half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sion, king of the Amorites, in the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land with the cities thereof in the coast, even the cities of the country round about. And so basically they possessed, uh, we read there in verse 22, the Lord God back in, sorry, in our passage uh, in Judges 11, they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon to Jabok, from the wilderness, even unto Jordan. And the point is that none of that land was ever, in the possession of the Ammonites. So the land that's in dispute wasn't taken from the Ammonites, but it was taken from Sion and Og king of Bashan from the Amorites. And so he's just showing from history that their claim is a false claim. The very territory the king of the Ammonites was disputing with Jephthah had no historical basis for a quarrel with Israel over this land. In fact, on the contrary, they ought to have been thankful for Israel, that Israel, in obedience to God, 
did not come into their land and left them to their land. And, and so instead of having a dispute, they ought to have been thankful. They were left alone. And so the king of Ammonites of the Ammonites was distorting the truth to claim that Israel had took their land. And I believe today that even the things that are going on in the land of Israel, it's based on bogus history. The, the, there was never was a Palestinian state ever. They were, they were Jordanians, <laughs> and that's who they were, and they were wanderers and all the rest of it. And so, uh, again, it's a, it's a completely false idea that's behind all of this, and history doesn't support it. But today, in our woke culture, people have no kind of acceptance of historical facts. It's all based on how they feel. I feel like the Palestinians have been badly treated. And there's a whole story there that I don't have time to go into, but the history is very different to the reality that is being told us today. So the land didn't belong to the Ammonites or the Moabites when Israel had taken possession of it. It was the land of the Amorites that they had possessed by right of conquest. God had given them into his hand, and they had defeated their enemy. And again, it's just an interesting thing, but we, it's good to know our Bible history. Even in, in the New Testament, some of the greatest sermons in the New Testament were based on biblical history. I think a Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Masterful sermon. What did he do? He rehearsed God's dealings with Israel. <laughs> he, he just went through the history. And he showed every, every time that, that God had tried to introduce a change in his dealings, Israel resisted every single time. And so he just uses history as a president. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. What does Peter do? He rehearses history. And so it's, it's just good to know that, in a sense, our faith has tremendous historical roots. It is the historic Christian faith. It's based on history. And it's good to know that history, to understand that history. And, and so, again, do we know our Bible history? It's important. Reading the Old Testament is so critical. It's such so foundational. It's, it's so much of our New Testament. Well, it was written by the New Testament was written by men whose Bible was the Old Testament. And, and it bleeds through the text of the New Testament constantly. And these men knew their Bibles. They knew their Old Testament. And, and so we, we need to know the Old Testament, too. We need to know this history. It's very important. So his, his argument from history. <clears throat> Verse 23 and 24, he now turns from history to theology. And he starts talking about the God of Israel versus the gods that the Ammonites were enamored with. And so he says, so now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, and shouldest thou possess it? In other words, your argument is not with us, it's with God. It was the Lord God of Israel that dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And should you possess it? When, when the Lord God of Israel took it from the Amorites, he gave the victory and he gave it to Israel. So are you going to mess with God? Are you going to mess with the Lord God of Israel? Instead, he says, "Wilt thou not possess that which Chemosh, thy God, giveth thee to possess. Verse 24. So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, them will we possess. And so uh, this is kind of a bit of a put down on Chemosh. You should, you should basically live in the land which your God has given you, and by comparison to the land of, of Israel, it wasn't much. <laughs> and so you should be satisfied with that because your God really hadn't done much for you. So it's kind of a bit of a put down. And, and here's an interesting twist, and I want to just kind of throw this out here because when you look elsewhere in the Bible, it's never mentioned that Chemosh is the God of the Ammonites. In fact, Chemosh is the god of the Moabites. 
And I, I just want to show you that in the word of God, because it, it's just interesting. And, and we'll make some conclusions from that. But again, just it's really important to pay attention to the text. I find it so fascinating when you look at these things and, and, and kind of seek them out, try to understand them. You get some interesting lessons. And so 1 Kings 11 is where we'll begin. Let's break in in verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So who's the abomination of the Ammonites? It's not Chemosh, it's Milcom. Okay? And look at verse 7. Then Solomon did build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And so uh, Ammon, <coughs> Milcom, and some say Milcom and Molech is basically the same de deity. But basically the children of Ammon, they were worshippers of Molech or Milcom, and the um, Moabites were worshippers of Chemosh. Look um, with me, please, at verse um, 33 of the same chapter. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father, did David his father. Now look, please, at 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 13, sorry, chapter 23, 2 Kings 23 and verse 13, 2 Kings 23, verse 13, it says, And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had builded for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. So we can see pretty conclusively from Scripture that actually the normal God associated with the Ammonites was Milcom, or Molech, and the normal god associated with the Moabites was Chemosh. And yet Jephthah, as he is speaking to them, he mentions, will you not possess that which Chemosh thy god giveth thee to possess? So is this some kind of scribal error or something like that, or, or is it accurate to the text? When, of course, every evidence manuscript-wise is this is absolutely accurate to the text. But uh, you remember how close together Moab and Ammon were, right? They came basically from the same father. Lot had fathered with his two daughters. These uh, people groups, two nations had come uh, as a result of Lot's incestuous relationship. So they were always uh, together. They're often mentioned together in the scriptures. And so could it be that they were so closely related that they shared cultural and religious ideas, including interchanging the worship of their deities. A kind of early ecumenism, an early interfaith worship between the two. And I believe that's, that's a simple explanation. These Moab and Ammon, are so closely connected together, their their land is close by each other, and I believe that there was there was, there's perhaps the an early development of what we would say is interfaith worship or the evil of ecumenicalism, and it, here it is found uh, this early on in scripture, and uh, of course even earlier we see it in uh, num uh, the back book of Genesis chapter eleven where they're trying to unite uh, one world against God. Uh, following all strange things, but not following him in defiance of God. But certainly I suggest that this is the case because these two are often mentioned together in the word of God and uh, many, many occasions uh, we see that. So having dealt with theology, in other words, your God has not given you much. Our God has given us this land. 
now we come to arguments from experience. And so verse 25 through 27. And so it says, Now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? So he said, you're just acting like Balak did. Remember, he tried to curse Israel and all the rest of it and uh, was hostile towards Israel. And you're just acting in part. You're just like Balak. Uh, the, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, in the way you're acting right now. You, you know better than him in the way you're treating the children of Israel. And then he says, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns in, in, and in Aror and her towns and all the cities that be along by the coast of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did you not recover them within that time? So here's an interesting observation, because actually, if you, if you add up judges up to this point, and some have, you know, that, that are really students of this, have said that actually at the time of Jephthah, where in the 450-year period of the judges, we're at 319, <laughs> the year 319, in terms of the period of, from, from the beginning of the judges, 300 and 19, so around 300 years. So it, it, the idea is this, in all the 300 years since Israel possessed the land, you have never made a claim until now. So why now? If, if this is really your land, why didn't you come and get it? You've had 300 years to do something about this. Why are you suddenly wanting to take it now when it's been yours all these years? And it's amazing, isn't it, that um, in 1948, when Israel was declared a nation by the United Nations, and that was a, an amazing, uh, amazing thing that that happened. Um, all of a sudden, all these people suddenly get interested in the land of, of Israel. <laughs> they weren't interested beforehand. It, it had been, you know, throughout the Ottoman Empire, just being a wasteland. Nobody was interested in it. But in 1848, when Israel took possession of it, then all of a sudden, they, it, they're all making a claim, this is our land. And so you get the same idea. And so I would just, again, just say this disputed territory, they had lots of time to claim it. They've had the whole period of the judges up to now uh, to, to do this. And now, why now? If it really is your land, why did you not come and get it before? And so it says, wherefore I have not sinned, verse 27, against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge, be judged this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Again, he makes an appeal to God. God, the judge, he appeals to him to judge this day between the children of Israel. And he did because he gave victory to the children of Israel. We're going to see that uh, in, in subsequently. And, and so the Lord did judge. And again, isn't it good that he, this man knows God uh, and he, he refers to him constantly and he calls him the Lord, the judge. And by the way, what a reminder. He is the Lord, the judge. And every one of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so we need to be conscious of that. And so, again, there's some good practical things here. When we defend our faith, it's a kind of a good model to follow here. You start with history. Our faith is a historical faith. Everything we believe, every doctrine we hold has a historical basis. And it's good to recognize that, isn't it? We can trace God's dealings in history. And we know that everything we believe has a historical basis. And I'm going to give you an example. If you had Mormons come to your door yeah, what they would do is, you see, they don't have any historical basis for the Book of Mormon, even though they have spent millions in digging up North America, looking for even the slightest evidence of the things that, which are taught in that book. They have come up empty, M not just millions of dollars, but man hours, uh, just amazing uh, efforts have been made to try to support their doctrinal position from history, and they're coming up blank. And so what do they resort to? Uh, 
When they come to your door, what they'll say to you is this. Read the Book of Mormon. And um, as you read it, uh, you uh, what you need to do is pray that God would somehow give you that witness that this is the truth. And how he'll give you that witness is that you you'll you'll feel it's right. <laughs> right? So that the whole argument is based on experience, not on history, and not even on theology. It's on experience. And so again, what we're defending, a historical faith, its theology comes out of its history. And yes, it does result in experience. Praise God that we, we, we know experientially this is true as well, but we don't use that as the base of our argument. We have history to support us. Uh, we have theology to support us. So I'll give you, uh, let me give you an example of why what I'm talking about from Scripture. So, so for instance, uh, the fall of man. Do we have historical evidence of the fall of man? Well, yeah, look at Romans 5. Paul, as he's defending the lostness of humanity and the need of the gospel of the grace of God, in Romans 5, verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So he goes back to history. And the historical Adam, by the way, I absolutely believe in the historical Adam, that he was a real man created in the image and likeness of God, and the Garden of Eden was real, and nothing about it is mythological, nothing about it. It's, it's absolute history. And that history was that when that one man sinned in disobedience to God, then the world came crashing down with its head. The federal head of the world sinned, and the whole universe, as it were, came crashing down with him. And so through one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. And so Paul's whole theology of the fall and the need of redemption is based on history, right? So he's got history, he's got theology. And then we can point to experience. I have children. I'm looking forward to seeing them in a few days. But I never had to teach any of my children to do wrong. Not one. <laughs> they seemed to have an amazing natural propensity when they were little to say no and to disobey and to rebel. And where did they get that from? Well, they got it from Papa. <laughs> they got it from me. And I got it from, and, and so experience confirms history, doesn't it? So we have history, we have theology in the book of Romans, and we have experience that backs it up. And it's a wonderful thing when we think of our faith. It's a solid historical basis for what we believe. Even, even secular history acknowledges the existence of Jesus Christ. I've been told that without the Bible, you could pretty much reconstruct the entire New Testament from quotations in history. It's, it's historically proven to be true. The tomb is still empty. The body's never been recovered. He's alive, right? It's a historical faith. And it's, a, it's theology is based on its history, based on God's revelation. And so, again, this is the way we defend our faith. And, and so we see here, verse 28, Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not to the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Even though his argument is well constructed, it's based on history, theology, and experience. And yet it says, the children of Ammon hearken not. And that tells me this that ultimately you can present all the evidence, but it still comes down to this. The will is the key to the intellect. I was speaking not too long ago, and there was some reaction to the word of God, and it wasn't positive. <laughs> and uh, people were upset uh, because of the things that were being taught. Because, And so as we discuss these things, 
I kept saying, your argument is not with me. It's with the word of God. This is what it says. This is, this is historically true, what we're looking at. And it was kind of interesting uh, because I, it, it, a verse that keeps coming to my mind when we're in these kind of situations is the Lord's words in John 7 and verse 17. I've often quoted this, but I really believe this is what it comes down to. See, I think the people I was talking to, they had already made up their minds about what they were going to do. And the Lord says, in John 7, 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. He'll know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And I believe the bottom line is this. Are we willing to do his will? Because if we are, then we'll know. But I believe I was talking to people who were not willing. They had already made their minds up. Don't confuse me with the facts. I have made my mind up, right? And it's a tragic thing. And, and, and I really believe that uh, this is a critical thing. Will we or won't we be obedient to the word of God? And we'll have no under difficulty understanding the scriptures. If we come to the scriptures with a bowed will, Lord, you show me your will and I'll obey it. And God will reveal great truths to you. But if you say to the Lord, um, Lord, I, I want to get something out of your word, but but I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that, and I don't want to do this. <laughs> In fact, I won't do those things. I think you'll have a hard time getting anything from God. So <clears throat> the Ammonites, even though evidence is clearly presented, they're determined to do what they intend to do. And that's the flesh. <laughs> I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't care what God says. What's that going to do with anything? It's got everything to do with everything. And so may we be submissive fully to the revealed will and word of God and have hearts of willing submission and delight like the Lord Jesus. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God. May that be what characterizes us for his glory. Amen.